Will the United States finally get tough with China about human rights in Tibet? The Chinese leadership has a built-in lobby in the American business community that says don't really and truly get tough with China. Progress in the human rights area comes slowly and it requires persistence and determination. Tonight on Frontline, a journey to the roof of the world. Correspondent Orville Schell explores the ancient and mystical culture of Tibet and its struggle with China for survival. I wanted to see for myself the consequences of China's occupation and what had happened to these people who had always so prized their independence from the outside world. If the Tibetan people want their land, you have to fight for it. Tonight, red flag over Tibet. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. Tibetans call it Choma Longma, goddess mother of the earth. We know it as Mount Everest. In a valley in Tibet just below the mountain lies Rongbok Monastery. Once this was a thriving community of Buddhist monks. Today it is empty. Its chanting halls and courtyards are ruined wrecked not by time or carelessness, but by human intent. Rongbuk was destroyed less than 30 years ago, smashed on Chinese orders as part of an effort to rid this place not just of its religion and culture and history, but of its soul as well. But those forces were not able to destroy the spirit of this man, His Holiness Tenzin Gyatso, the 14th Dalai Lama. His mission is to remind the world of what happened in Tibet. Nice to see you again. Last spring, he came to Washington, looking for support among movers and shakers of both parties. Yes, I'm a little descendant from Alaska. Nice to see you, sir. While the politicians may be attracted by the strength of his cause, we, we were together in Lhasa. They also seem drawn to his mere presence. Got together and enjoyed it. Great. I saw your picture everywhere. <laughs> and enthralled, perhaps, by the anomaly of a world leader who has no country. Freedom, freedom, freedom. That night, stars from another freedom, constellation of American power freedom, turned out. I, I, I'm a motherless child alone. They were drawn as much by his spiritual message as the high drama of his flight into exile and his people's tragic history. In 1949, the young Dalai Lama sent an urgent message to India, Britain, the United States, and the United Nations. It was a plea for help. The People's Liberation Army had crossed the border between China and Tibet, and Communist China was invading his country. No one came to the aid of Tibet. Now it seemed that almost everyone was willing to help this dispossessed God King. And with a new administration in Washington, this might be his time. The hope was that finally Tibet would get on the agenda, that after years of being ignored, the Dalai Lama's cause would become a part of U.S. trade negotiations with China, opening the possibility that one day he might be able to return home again. My name's Orville Schell. For many years I've written about China, but until now, I'd never had a chance to travel by road from Nepal 
up into the Himalayas to the border and the town of Drom. Today, it has a Chinese name, Zhangmu. At first, it seems like just another border town and an easy mix of nomads from the high plateau, young people looking for a way out, Tibetan tradesmen and Chinese merchants. But it doesn't take long to sense the weight of Chinese control here. People are cautious in Jiangmu. A Tibetan shopkeeper is guarded as he talks about the Dalai Lama. The price of speaking openly to a foreigner is all too often arrest and beating by the police. Journalists are not welcome here. We came as tourists with a small home video camera to keep a record of a journey that over four days would take us by truck and jeep to the capital, Lhasa. I wanted to see for myself the consequences of China's occupation and what had happened to these people who had always so prized their independence from the outside world. I had, of course, read the early accounts of foreigners who came to see what lay behind these mountains. Generations of soldiers, diplomats, mystics, missionaries, and adventurers all met stubborn resistance in their attempts to breach Tibet's isolation. It was a dream mankind wanted to dream, wrote the Austrian Heinrich Haar. For the Europeans who made this map in the 1930s, Tibet was the hidden kingdom behind the Himalayan massif, a fairy tale Shangri La that was, in fact, a vast expanse of mountain plateau, larger than Europe. Now, its ancient boundaries have been reduced by Beijing to the Tibetan Autonomous Region. Our journey would take us from the Nepali border, past Mount Everest, to Shigatse, Gyantse, and finally Lhasa. Prayer flags mark a mountain pass, the La Lung La, at 17,000 feet. Up here it seems you would need some sort of faith to survive in this wilderness some way to placate all the ancient spirits that inhabit the landscape. During the 7th and 8th centuries, Tibetan animism merged with Buddhism from India. It forged a faith so powerful that pilgrims would prostrate themselves over and over again, measuring the distance all the way to Lhasa. Pilgrims would have passed through villages like this one. From the road above, life seems hardly to have changed from the time when Milarepa, the great poet and ascetic, lived here in the 11th century. The harvest is still barley, the staple of Tibetan life. A day's travel down the road in the town of Shigartzong, there is a reminder of the lengths to which the Tibetans went to protect their way of life. These fortifications survive for centuries, only to be destroyed by modern invaders, raid guards in the Cultural Revolution. Now old Tibet is being undone by a new force. Tens of thousands of Han Chinese immigrants from central China who arrive on this frontier seeking their fortunes. The proud owner of this restaurant is a Muslim from Gansu province. 
Does he mind living here in self-imposed exile? Not at all. He's making better money than back home, he says. In fact, he tells me cheerfully, he owns the only generator in town. So after hours, he can turn his restaurant into a karaoke bar. Christmas tree lights and tinsel made in China for export to the West end up here, providing a little glitz in this otherwise desolate outpost. We'd been traveling for three days when we reached Shigatse in one of the greatest monasteries in Tibet, Tashi Lumpo. The monastery survived the Chinese occupation because it is the seat of the second most revered religious figure after the Dalai Lama, the Panchen Lama. Because he initially cooperated with the Chinese, Tashi Lumpo was spared. <laughs> Standing beneath the 60-foot-high Buddha of loving-kindness, surrounded by the smoke of burning yak butter, in this extraordinary place, it's tempting to imagine that life here is as it always was. In the 1930s, when these pictures were taken, Tashi Lumpo was completely unperturbed by the outside world. It was a community of more than 6,000 monks. Today, there are only 600 monks here. The Communist Party's Democratic Management Committee controls all religious activity. Only in recent years have a few novices been allowed to enter monastic life. No belief system could have been more at odds with Tibetan Buddhism than Maoism, with its concept of liberation through struggle and revolution. Buddhism, however, stressed liberating the soul through compassion and spiritual practice. While Tibetan Buddhists accepted the external world as they found it, Maoists strive to remake the world. Especially what they saw as the inequity of the monastic system, where a quarter of the male population were monks living off a system of serfdom. In effect, a feudal theocracy. Tibetans respond by saying that they have no history of mass famine or rebellion against the monastic system. Equally, it's hard to judge the Chinese claims that life for ordinary Tibetans is better today. The economic reforms have brought material improvements for some, but progress also seems to have come at a cost. Now there are only 66 monks in Gyantse's Pelkor Monastery, where the great 15th century stupa of a thousand images attracts fewer pilgrims these days. They make their circumambulations, repeating the mantra, Om Mani Padme Om, the jewel in the heart of the lotus, to earn merit for their next life. They are mostly older. 
There is a generation missing here. One of the last natural barriers to intruders trying to reach Lhasa is the mountain pass known as the Kerala. It was at the turn of the century that the modern world first forced its way into the heart of Tibet. In 1904, a British expeditionary force under Colonel Francis Young Husband was intent on reaching the forbidden city, Lhasa. He ignored an appeal from the Dalai Lama's envoy to go no further. By the time the British soldiers stopped firing, 600 Tibetans lay dead. Young husband finally entered Lhasa through the west gate, below the Dalai Lama's fabled palace, the Potala. But he had no intention of staying or colonizing Tibet. His concern was the great game so he forced a treaty on Tibetans to stay clear of Tsarist Russia, and his duty done, he marched back out. There was, of course, always the threat of China's territorial claims. But other than a brief interlude from 1910 to 1911, when imperial troops did occupy Lhasa, Tibet remained essentially undisturbed. Today, arriving on the main road into Lhasa, I could hardly miss the Golden Yaks, a gift to Tibetans to celebrate the 40th anniversary of their peaceful liberation by the People's Republic of China. Lhasa now feels like a Chinese city, with no more romance than any other provincial capital, were it not for its dramatic mountain setting and its most famous landmark. For five centuries, the Potala was the seat of secular and religious power and home to the Dalai Lama. When the last Dalai Lama died in 1933, High Lamas set out to find the successor. Signs, dreams, and oracles led them far from the inbred world of Lhasa to bring back his reincarnation. He was a little boy from a farm family, Lamo Dandro, renamed Tenzin Gyatso, the 74th reincarnation of the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Chenrezig. In 一个世界的国王在那里 Outside the religious hierarchy, secular society was also rigidly divided between ordinary Tibetans and the landed aristocracy. They were the class who took on the responsibilities of government, but also enjoyed a privileged way of life that now seems sublimely out of time.
1943, the young Dalai Lama was nine years old. That year, the Chinese reasserted their old claim to Tibet. A delegation from Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist China arrived in Lhasa. Its leader, Dr. Sheng Sun-lian, called Tibet the Hermit Kingdom, fossilized many centuries back. But he also acknowledged that for all practical purposes, Tibet has enjoyed full independence. But while Dr. Shun tried to counter British influence in Lhasa, his own government was running out of time back home. In 1949, Mao's Red Army defeated the Nationalists. In the wake of the Communist victory, the party leadership turned their attention to consolidating the motherland, including Tibet. A year later, Chinese troops marched into Lhasa. At first, little changed in the structures of daily life. The Dalai Lama was still surrounded by the intrigues of the court. But it became clear that there was no longer any avoiding China's new leaders. So in 1954, to the consternation of his people, he set out in a cloud of burning incense to make the long journey to Beijing. He once told me that at the time he was hopeful that some sort of accommodation was possible. He thought there was some common ground between Buddhist philosophy and the promise of altruism in this new society. He said he even came to think of himself as a Buddhist monk holding Marxist economic and political views. He was only 19 years old. After meeting Mao, he described him as a simple man of dignity and authority, a strong magnetic force. But he remembers being disturbed when Mao confided to him that, of course, religion is poison. In fact, the Chinese were as intent on making changes in Tibet as they were elsewhere in China. But what they called democratic reforms quickly ran into resistance, especially from the warlike Kampas of eastern Tibet. Seeing a Cold War opportunity, the CIA even supported them for a while. By 1959, the resistance had turned into active rebellion within Lhasa itself. The Chinese responded with force. The counterattack begins. Our troops attack and occupy the rebel positions on Yolong Hill. This is a propaganda film made after the events. But it has been reported that the Red Army used artillery to bombard the city, including the Dalai Lama's summer palace. The rebels, working hand in hand with foreign reactionaries, betrayed the motherland. And lacking the support of the people, they quickly crumbled. Thousands of Tibetans were killed and wounded, and thousands more arrested. Fearing his own detention, the Dalai Lama had meanwhile been persuaded to flee. With a small party of supporters, he headed uncertainly into the mountains towards the border with India. He would not see Lhasa again. Lhasa's 20,000 inhabitants hold a grand rally on the square before the Patala Palace. five-starred red flag of our motherland flutters high over Lhasa. Today, 35 years later, the People's Liberation Army is more in evidence than ever. On the roof of the Potala, Chinese soldiers and tourists come to gawk at the sights. They seem oblivious of the Tibetans, except to dress up in caricatures of native costume. Confident of their colonial right to rule this place, 
they choose for the moment to ignore the tension just below the surface. All this takes place just outside what was once the Dalai Lama's personal quarters. Tibetans still visit the throne room where he once held audiences. The faithful make their offerings while outside his bedroom, a Chinese visitor, unaware of the camera, holds forth. He wonders why the Dalai Lama doesn't just come home. It is the Chinese penchant for historical amnesia, forgetting what happened in the intervening years just outside this window. The 20 years after 1959 are like a black hole in Tibet's history. The only public record, a few propaganda films. These were the years that included the Cultural Revolution. While it is a fact many Tibetans joined in to attack their own heritage, few could have imagined how far it would all go. By the time it was over, more than 6,000 monasteries, temples and shrines had been destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of Tibetans had been arrested and imprisoned. According to estimates by the Dalai Lama's government in exile, over a million people died as a consequence of the Chinese invasion. Tens of thousands of them died of torture or by execution. And all of this happened beyond the view of the world. The Chinese government would like to forget the devastation of those years. But a few officials now find it in their interest to preserve some remnants of Tibetan culture. They are part of an inspection tour from the National Bureau of Tourism. This is what they came to oversee, an ersatz Tibet, sanitized in a hotel lobby and denatured of everything real or dangerous. And for those visiting officials bored by the show, there are always the attractions of the karaoke bars that now line Happiness Road below the Potala. The videos are from Taiwan and Hong Kong, images for a new China intent on reinventing itself, a long way from anything Tibet has to offer. Tourism is important to the Chinese. After all, this means foreign currency. High-priced tours flown into Lhasa for a three-day view of the Potala, Tashi Lumpo, and one of the few other monasteries left intact. It's also a way to show the world that China is living up to its new pledge to preserve Tibet's traditional culture and religion. But tourism can cut both ways, especially when a few visitors find their way to the great monastery of Ganden. This is all that remains of the place that was called the Joyful Paradise. It was blown up in the Cultural Revolution. The few buildings that have been restored were paid for by Tibetans. And from what the monks can earn selling souvenirs to visitors. In downtown Lhasa, traditional life finds itself under a different kind of assault. Modernization, together with Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms, have created a commercial boom. 
Concern with material consumption rather than reincarnation now rules the day. This street peddler is from Sichuan Province. He's been here a year and already he has two people working for him. He says there's money to be made here and he thinks he can do well. These young Tibetans have no such hopes. Squeezed out of the job market, they are left hanging out on the streets. Resentful of the Chinese, they have reason to be careful about what they say. When you look at Tibet, it seems like a calm and normal place. Actually, we are living under Chinese oppression. There are thousands of informers watching over each and every Tibetan. Basically, the Chinese are enjoying life, and the Tibetans are suffering. Except in the Barkor, the Tibetan way of life has been stolen from us. But even in the Barkor, the center of old Lhasa, the authorities are pulling down Tibetan buildings, claiming they're unsafe. Suddenly, property has value, and new buildings and businesses push their way into the heart of the old town. People are angry. I am not the only person who is afraid and distressed. All Tibetans have these feelings. But we cannot express our feelings in words because of the Chinese oppression. Basically, we are in a situation that fits with a Tibetan saying, even if your heart is burning and in flames, do not let smoke out of your mouth. At the center of the Barkor is the Joko. This is the most holy place in Tibet, the ultimate destination for all pilgrims. As evening comes, I am drawn into the stream of people circumambulating the Jokhan. Where merchants and worshippers, nomads and mendicants, join in a medieval procession of Tibetan life. And just off to the side, I find an open doorway. Unexpectedly, I am on the roof of the Jokhan. It seems so peaceful tonight, but I can also feel a palpable tension here, a sense of something about to happen, as it has so often in the past. It was March 1988, a year before the tragedy in Tiananmen Square, monks demanding the release of political prisoners and chanting independence slogans were joined by ordinary Tibetans. At the time, the official policy of the security forces was, quote, merciless repression of all rebels. The fighting was captured on official surveillance cameras. It spread throughout the city. But police reserved a special ferocity for their counterattack on the Jokhan. Next year, there would be more such demonstrations. Each time, security forces responded with mass arrests. The Chinese keep saying they gave us human rights. 
But in reality, we don't even have freedom of speech. And when you end up in prison, they mercilessly torture you using all kinds of methods. They simply regard you as an animal. They suspend you in the air, shackle your limbs, rub ice on your skin, and hit you with an electric prod. They will use unthinkable methods to punish you. They have special places where these tortures occur, and they take place all the time. We met a young Tibetan who had seen the inside of many of those places, like Dropchi, Lhasa's largest and most notorious prison. According to the International Campaign for Tibet, Dropchi is for long-term political prisoners many of whom were serving five to fifteen years for demonstrating in the bar court. There are now reportedly more than two hundred prisoners of conscience here. Setru is a detention center. It is used for isolation and interrogation. Torture cells are reported to be underground here. Sangya prison is known for its hard labor. I find it hard to imagine how Tibetans, faced with this brutal system, can still believe in the Buddhist tradition of compassion. Even when I was a young boy, I understood a lot about His Holiness. But now I can no longer stand the Chinese brutality and torture. It has reached the point that I have no hesitation whatsoever to give up my life rebelling against the Chinese. My very last evening in Lhasa, I was approached by a young Tibetan. He wanted me to meet secretly with an elderly Lama. That night, as a thunderstorm broke outside, he recounted how his monastery had been destroyed. It's not easy to see the future, he told me. We keep going in circles. We may have to fight. Without taking up the gun, we will never solve our problems. Without fighting, the Chinese will never leave. The next morning we flew out of Tibet, across the mountains, through Nepal, and south to India, to the foothills of the Himalayas and the village of Dharamsala. This is where the Dalai Lama now lives in exile. It's an old British hill station, now a mecca of sorts to young Westerners seeking adventure and enlightenment. A Hindu village turned into a Buddhist sanctuary. What is most striking is the faces of the Tibetans. People fleeing the repression in Tibet often end up here at the refugee center. He says he was arrested putting up independence posters in Shigatse and was sentenced to 12 years in prison. He did hard labor in a mine. We were working in gold mines, but there was no food, and we didn't have enough to eat. We started working at 8 o'clock in the morning, digging, 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 looking for gold. That's how they made us work. So I escaped from prison. It took me two months to reach Lhasa. From Lhasa, I escaped to Nepal. They've given up everything to come here not knowing what the future holds. Some had no opportunities back home. Others left lives of relative security. Nawan Shodian and his wife had privileged positions. He was a senior editor at Lhasa Television. He says he left because the Beijing government is set on destroying Tibetan culture. For instance, promising Tibetan students are sent to China to study. When they return home, they cannot speak Tibetan. They only speak Chinese. And the way they think is completely Chinese. 
The signification of Tibet is what the exiles in Dharamsala fear, because it means that their country has been more than just colonized. Colonialism, primarily, it's a kind of an economic uh, taking advantage of someone. The Chinese come and do it for a number, of, you know, of factors. A lot of the Jamyang factors Norbu is a Tibetan intellectual living here. Sometimes they even seem to contradict each other. At the same time, they haven't, uh, like most other colonial powers, left the people pretty much to their own devices. They've, they've wanted more than people's wealth. You know, they've wanted their soul. But I think over and above all these things, there's this, the logic of power. And the communists at the time, you know, when they just came into power in Beijing, the idea of uh, taking back every bit of their old, or what they call their old empire. Uh, last night in Lhasa, uh, someone arranged for us to, to, to meet uh, an underground leader who was an a, a elderly lama at uh, one of the monasteries. And he quite surprisingly said that he had no hope for Tibet. I said, are you optimistic? He said, no. And I said, where is there any optimism on the horizon? He said, only if uh, people take up the gun. And, he, and I said, well, what about you? He said, I'll be there. Bully for him, I say. He's right. He's absolutely right. That's the only way. Whether that way is going to work or not is another story. But that's the only way we have. They're going to stay there. It's, in some ways, it's like an avalanche. You know, it's not only just a question of governments or the Chinese government or the Communist Party. There's this whole mass of people that need space. You know, and they're getting on rust buckets and trying to get to the United States. And now it's Tibet. If the Tibetan people want their land, they have to fight for it. But those who believe they must fight for their country come up against this the tradition of Buddhist nonviolence, so persuasively incarnate in the Dalai Lama and his message of patience and forbearance. Paul and Gyatso escaped from Tibet three years ago. He had been arrested and jailed for 15 years. What they do is tie you up and suspend you from the ceiling like a light bulb. Then they beat you. Your hands are tied behind your back. And when they hit the rope with a stick, your nerves receive a shock, causing uncontrollable urination and excretion. I had no freedom to die. That's how I suffered. But despite all those horrors, he holds to his faith. Our country has a history of 2,109 years. The history of communist China is only some 40 years. The Chinese are trying to swallow our country and eradicate its people. So the only way for us to challenge the Chinese is with historical facts and international laws, and by following the nonviolent path led by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama meets each new refugee who arrives in Dharamsala. <laughs> it must be hard for him not to question his own convictions when he hears another painful story of cruelty and abuse. <laughs> But his steadfastness in the face of such tragedy is a measure of his abiding faith in humanity. For the 35 years he's led his followers in government in exile, it is a position from which he has never wavered. <laughs> It is the source of his enormous moral standing. The Tibetan government has this... Um, it's always operated with this underlying hope that 
uh, if it conceded enough, the Chinese would uh, somehow allow the Tibetans to permit them some kind of little space of their own where they could practice their religion and uh, control their lives to even a small degree. But I think that uh, is uh, being very, very naive. But that has been a policy, Tibet, the policy of the Tibetan government for quite, a, quite some time now. When we left Dharamsala, the Dalai Lama had just returned to his home at the end of this ridge, looking out over the Indian plain. It was a long way from where the real decisions about the future of his homeland were being made. It was here in Seattle at the Asian Pacific Economic Conference last November when President Clinton met Chinese party chief Jiang Zemin that the issue of Tibet came home to the U.S. The Tibetan protesters had been kept over to the side, away from the hotel entrance. Emotions were running high. It was ironic that just now, when the new administration had finally made Tibet an issue in American foreign policy, that the president's press secretary should find herself so attacked. Under the circumstances, there was really nothing she could do or say. But in this television age, diplomacy often requires symbolic gestures as the president himself made obvious when he appeared with Jiang Zemin. If this presidential scowl symbolized Clinton's displeasure with China's treatment of Tibet, he was still left with the quandary, how to balance the moral issues with the hard reality of billions of dollars in trade with China. The Chinese leadership has no such moral dilemma. They know what they want a place alongside the world's great industrial nations. And they also know that they now have leverage over American jobs like these at Boeing. Boeing has been a friend of China for many years since uh, normalization of relations in 1972. And we sold 10 707s about a year after uh, Nixon went over to Beijing and a lot of their uh, airplanes have followed. Right now, one out of every seven of the airplanes that we make goes to the People's Republic of China. The Chinese, of course, want renewal of their most favored nation status. But this year, the U.S. is insisting that one condition is the protection of Tibet's unique cultural and religious heritage. For Zhang, this demand is nothing but interference in China's internal affairs. According to the Dalai Lama's representative in the U.S., Lodi Gari, the government in exile is really only hoping for a chance to talk. And we're not asking, you know, the American government to deliver us, you know, Tibet on a silver plate. You cannot do that. We're just simply asking the United States government to use as leverage to urge the Chinese leaders to have honest and serious dialogue leading into negotiations with his holiness and his representatives. The idea of a dialogue is also appealing to an administration trying to find a way through the MFN impasse. Mr. Secretary, uh, the president in May uh, called on China to show some signs of protecting uh, Tibet's uh, unique cultural and religious heritage. And I'm wondering what that means precisely and how do we know uh, if those conditions have uh, been met? I think that was one of the reasons why the president suggested a uh, dialogue with the Dalai Lama as a way to address that problem, uh, because we've not seen progress, uh, progress in that area. Progress in the human rights area comes slowly, and it requires persistence and determination. Uh, I don't think anybody should be surprised that out of this first meeting, a relatively brief meeting between, between two heads of state, there was not 
tangible progress. It was not that kind of a meeting. You think we're any closer to solving the uh, Tibet problem as a result of the talks the last couple of days? Well, I don't think any one meeting is going to solve the Tibet problem. Unfortunately, it's such a difficult and important problem. But I think it's very significant that the president raised it at his first meeting. Uh, so that Winston Lord is Under Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. You don't think Tibet will get lost in the shuffle? I mean, it doesn't have a very high dollar value on its trade. Or it's a very important issue, not only for the president, but for the Congress uh, and for the American people. I, I, we're about trying to set, you know, sort of specific goalposts right now about that. We, as, as Secretary said, you know, it's not. This is not quite the time to do that. Mm -hmm. But you want to include that in the mix. You want to say, look, here are a range of things we want significant progress on. Do you think if they really did talk with the Speaker of the Dalai Lama unconditionally? That would uh, be a good uh, milestone? Yes. David Gergen is special advisor to the president. Everyone, it seemed, would be satisfied if the two sides would just talk. You know, in terms satisfactory to him. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. But even if Zhang ever agreed to talks, he revealed in a news conference what the Tibetans would come up against on the question of their independence. Tibet has long been an inalienable part of the Chinese territory. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China, Tibet has all along been an autonomous region of China. No Chinese official would agree to an interview with us, but at a press briefing, a single question to the delegation's official spokesman revealed how the Chinese really feel about the Dalai Lama. Some opinion makers have depicted the Dalai Lama as a standard bearer of human rights. I feel that is not accurate. The policies he pursued and defended in Tibet were much crueler than the system of serfdom in medieval Europe. The Chinese view of traditional Tibet is a measure not just of their prejudice, but also of their belief that Tibetans needed to be saved by liberation. They use various means of torture against the serfs. At that time, their cups for drinking wine were made of human skulls, and their drums were made with human skin. There is such a gulf between these two sides that it's difficult to imagine how negotiations alone will ever bridge the gap. Uh, we have a saying which says that the Tibetans are always betrayed by their hope, because, and the Chinese are always betrayed by their mistrust. Because Chinese, you see, somehow always, you know, mistrust, and they're always suspicious of everything. On the other hand, the Tibetans you know, always have this eternal hope, you know, that even at the, the very critical moments they're thinking that oh something very nice will happen so I think that is in our true but also that has been our strength Tibetans have always taken strength from their religion the arrival of the Chinese brought a tragic collision between two contradictory views of life that never had much prospect of understanding each other Chinese projections of what Tibet should be were no less a product of their worldview than those of the Westerners drawn to this amazing but reluctant city. On the day we climbed Chukpori Hill, we were followed by a young Tibetan boy who lived just below. As he tried to tell me about the pilgrims who still circumambulate the Potala, it seemed to me that no matter what the outside world decides, Something ineffable is being lost here. All he had now from his own tradition was a fragment, a stone that he had carved and wanted to sell me. It was inscribed with the Tibetan Buddhist mantra, evoking the wisdom, compassion, and embodiment of Chenrezig in his present reincarnation, the 14th Dalai Lama.
Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. For video cassette information about this program, please call this toll-free number, 1-800-328-PBS-1.